the big uh, course theme that this lecture seems to uh, help us with is this idea of how the current situation tends to cloud or alter or influence how we interpret the evidence provided by the historical record. And we've been hearing this from the start of the course, that the historical record itself is not a stable entity. It thickens as we move forward. Uh, we discover things and are challenged. Our historical interpretations are challenged constantly. Uh, and we have to rethink it because new evidence comes to light, new technologies, new information. The second thing is that our interests, are the questions we ask of history, also change. Some would see this as a corruption of history uh, and claim that there is a way to not allow that corruption of history. Well, we can do better, uh, but we can never totally eliminate the way current concerns impact previous uh, understandings and previous interpretations. And this body of evidence helps us when we get uh, to the later sites to look at how uh, in the moment of dramatic historical change, the historical record is, is altered or, in one case, erased in order to achieve specific outcomes in the present. And if you've read any George Orwell, you know how that works. Um, or you've seen it at least in fiction. And if you watch the news, uh, hopefully you know how that works. So um, some of the specific issues of this, of, the, of this lecture are informed by recent scholarship that are summarized by Charles Mann, a local scholar who's written two books one is called 1491, and the other one is called 1493. And in these two books, uh, he really attempts to nail down uh, the transformative power of this moment uh, where Europe comes into more direct contact and awareness of the Americas. Uh, he's doing something else also. Uh, he's visiting three specific issues um, that are remain controversial. Uh, one is, how many people were in the Americas at the moment when Columbus uh, encounters uh, the Americas? Uh, and we've talked about this before. Uh, historians used to believe and claim that it was something like 15 million. Well, it's um, probably more in the neighborhood of 100 million, give or take 10%. Um, it just became dramatically depopulated very rapidly through the ravages of the unfamiliar European diseases. The second issue is when did uh, the Americans come to these continents? When did they migrate across the Bering Strait? <clears throat> Not as interesting for what we're doing in this course. Um, the third issue, uh, what is the relationship that these Americans had to the landscape. When Europeans become aware and start studying the Americans, uh, we see them as uh, nomadic tribes wandering across a more or less empty natural landscape unaltered by their presence. This is a dramatically wrong fallacy, misconception, misrepresentation. Some would say a willful misrepresentation. Uh, it really was the case, uh, but we can forgive them because the evidence suggested that this was the case because these were the, the stragglers, the, the 3 to 10 percent survivors of the 100 million population. And they were wandering lost, many of them were wandering lost on the landscape. Um, the other big uh, mythology, yes? Mm -hmm. Especially at the one we are now. Mm -hmm. But it was more over in like the Ohio area. Yes. So was it perhaps that just like the Europeans as they came over were only seeing kind of the, the eastern coast where they traveled? Well, yeah. even the eastern coast. Um, the first uh, Italian explorer who came over with Verrazano uh, went up the east coast and reported a, a constant uh, column of smoke, 
uh, from villages all along the New England shoreline. And just 20 years later, the next person who came said it was basically empty. And when they came on shore, they saw abandoned villages. So even the East Coast was very densely populated. And uh, they weren't nomadic hunter-gatherers. They were farmers. They were highly developed agricultural farmers. And uh, if the last lecture was about uh, the agrarian civilizations uh, pitying and uh, disparaging the brutal Mongol hordes, uh, and yet the Mongol hordes uh, were the most successful empire in human history in terms of land area, population, and repopulation of the human species. Uh, this is a case where we had a very sophisticated uh, several hundred uh, distinct civilizations that were uh, reduced to a minor shadow of what they had been uh, and, and characterized as nomadic wanderers uh, without history. They are, they are characterized as a people with no history. And thus, this lecture should be very easy because there is no history to teach. Uh, they are timeless. They unchange. Nothing happens uh, that we would recognize as constituting history. Um, so we're done. Or are we? It turns out that, surprise, surprise, there was a history. It turns out, and this is another hot potato. Um, some, there's a lot of evidence that they had empires as brutal or more brutal than European empires. Uh, they had empires that were horrible stewards of the land. Uh, and so uh, this richer history is often resisted because uh, it's politically sensitive. And some people say, oh, great, you're justifying European brutality by saying that they're just like us. They're as bad as we were. Well, if we can just put that all on hold, look at the evidence, and try to see what the evidence itself tells us. It tells us, surprise, surprise, that humans are the way they are in a fairly well-dispersed pattern, um, whether we're talking about Europeans, Mongol hordes, uh, Asian island dwellers, uh, or the Americans, uh, that human behavior is what it is in all its bizarre diversity. Uh, were there beautifully poetic uh, stewards of the land? Yes, there were, uh, both in the West and in the Americas. Uh, were there brutal dictators who uh, were merciless uh, against uh, a tyrannically oppressed uh, population? Yes, there was that too. And so we're going to look at this, hopefully with a fairly open mind, um, and move beyond the contentiousness of some of this history. This is Machu Picchu, um, which we'll get back to hopefully if we have time. So our first stop is... Uh, the earliest moment of our journey is the Mayan people of the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, which is part of Mexico. Who's been there? And you're probably not from, who's from there? Okay, I didn't think so. Not a lot of people are from the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, the Mayan, very quickly, and you'll notice the first page of this sheet is fairly sparsely populated. Uh, this, uh, I'm uh, proving to you, if you have any doubt, the highly speculative nature of this course. That this course, this material hasn't really ever been taught this way. And uh, some topics, some sites uh, are better than others for, for really producing evidence of what architecture does as opposed to just what it might possibly mean in the abstract. Um, so uh, the, as we move back in time, the historical record and its interpretation both get a little bit thinner. Um, so here we are in Chichen Itza, which is on the Yucatan Peninsula, a very geologically bizarre situation, as we'll see. It's a pyramid complex that was covered with jungle and discovered quite recently. Uh, the larger perspective is that the Mayan peoples uh, started out uh, way beyond where we can really date accurately. And this is the moment of their highest flourishing. Um, we'll look at Tikal, which is typically the place we think of as the center of Mayan activity. 
But something happens uh, in the ninth century where in Tikal, the Mayan site Tikal, and also on the Yucatan Peninsula, suddenly, uh, in historical terms, quickly uh, is abandoned. And Chichen Itza, to the north, uh, reaches a high point in the next century. So what's going on here? This is um, something we can look at. Um, and this is more or less the distribution of those, uh, those uh, civilizations, uh, the mound cultures that Ana was uh, referring to, um, Teotihuacan uh, in Mexico. But the ones we're looking at uh, are the Mayans first, then Chaco Canyon in the Amer uh, southwest of the United States, uh, then Mexico City, and finally Tiwanaku, the Incan Empire of Peru in the Andes. So it's starting with Chichen Itza. This is the uh, most memorable uh, of the, and the, at the center of the complex uh, in Chichen Itza. And this is the great uh, pyramid temple devoted to Kukulkan, uh, which is a, a kind of serpent deity. You can see um, his how it was found. Uh, the serpent deity. It's a it's a feathered serpent uh, that's depicted in this, the grand staircase on the north face, um, and winds up beside this amazing staircase, very steep. And um, at the equinox, this is the shadow that is shown uh, on the serpent stair. The interesting thing is um, the, some of these people uh, are paying attention to the astronomy of uh, the planets, the movement of the stars and uh, the moon and the sun, and some less so. But here's uh, something that we'll see when we get to Stonehenge. Uh, a kind of a very careful, calculated, precise observation, as we saw uh, similarly in Samarkand with the observatory, but very, very precise calculations. Uh, there was an inner chamber um, where uh, something like a ruler would sit on the jaguar throne, a uh, bad picture of the jaguar throne. There was a highly developed um, language, uh, written language, that has been deciphered that uh, much of it is uh, a, a number system, they had zero. Uh, they had zero long before uh, it occurred in Eurasia. Um, and a, a very sophisticated mathematics that primarily manifested in the calan uh, this very complex overlapping three calendar system um, that I guess it's all written about down there. I didn't see that. Um, the site itself uh, is a system of um, walkways and now hotels. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, there's a few features of the site that we're going to look at very quickly. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> one of the more interesting ones is the cenote. There, there's several cenotes uh, of the Yucatan Peninsula that come from, that are left over from when the great comet uh, struck the Earth, leading to, it's speculated, the extinction of the dinosaurs some uh, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, these cenotes, these uh, sinkholes, uh, are places where the water collects and actually uh, created a great uh, contribution to the resilience of the Mayan during times of drought. Um, and these Sinkholes are still uh, wonderful pools for swimming in, um, but it occurs when the comet strikes the planet right at the Yucatan Peninsula. It liquefies the ground, which boils, uh, and the bubbling up of the rock uh, forms these, um, these vertical air pocket shafts and reservoirs of water below. Uh, and we see um, how that contributed to uh, the, geo the bizarre, unique uh, geological formation that becomes one of the key uh, pragmatic and religious markers of uh, the Mayan flourish at this moment in time. Um, who's been there? Can't wait to go.
Um, <coughs> looking at the different uh, features of the site, and here we get, this is, I apologize, this is more like a, a survey lecture where it's, it moves through the material quite descriptively, and we struggle to piece it together in a larger narrative. And maybe we just do it that way. I'm, I'm reluctant to impose too much of, a, of an, interpretation, an interpretive layering, layering on top of this. But these are the warrior columns uh, that were part of the uh, character of the society, venerating the, the warriors as we see in other uh, societies, uh, laid out. Uh, along these fields, uh, there's the ball court, which was, of course, as we've seen elsewhere, a, um, a simulation of battle. And um, I was looking for it, but I haven't found it. Um, there's an awful lot of resonance between what we see here in Mayan culture and what we're going to see uh, in the Mexica in Mexico City um, in a few minutes. Uh, but these hoops on the side... Uh, and it's possible that an earlier culture, um, Tiwanaku, um, or the, uh, the, out of which they emerge, uh, could have common roots. Um, and so we see the ball fields. We quickly pop over to Tikal, where we see these uh, tremendous temples. Um, it, again, overgrown with forest, but rediscovered and cleared uh, quite recently. And uh, for some reason that they're still speculating on, uh, there was a, a, a rapid decline, as I mentioned, of Tikal. Um, and the idea, um, the, the clearest message we get, and the closest we get to a larger narrative, might be that um, uh, Chichen Itza benefited from a greater connectivity uh, with neighboring towns. It even went so far as to develop a port. Um, the port of, uh, of Ila Charitos, which is the Hispanic name, uh, not the uh, Mayan name. Uh, but it had this, uh, this port connection, road connections, trade connections, a greater diversity of population, uh, that uh, some believe is resu uh, resulted in uh, a more a greater diversity and thus a capacity of greater resilience uh, to respond to ecological challenges. A dramatic drought uh, hit the y Yucatan Peninsula, and um, speculation, uh, although evidence is a little tricky because um, some of the places that survived were actually arguably in drier areas uh, than the ones who, uh, who disappeared and declined. So there must have been something else going on. It wasn't just climate, as is usually the case. It takes more than just climate uh, to lead to the decline of a civilization. Um, the, another theory less well uh, documented is that they had, instead of a tyrannical ruler, although there was someone who sat on that jaguar throne inside the, the the Kukulkan temple, uh, they were governed by a council. And that there's speculation that that was another source of um, some of the, uh, the resilience of this particular site uh, in the Mayan culture. The cenotes were centers not just of uh, sources of water, but they were, of course, sacred sites. Uh, they've ex excavated the bottom of some of these uh, deep sea or deep water archaeology have found uh, precious items, uh, gold, uh, and the skeletons of human sacrifice. And so um, these cenotes were a very important part of also the religious system. Um, but um, I'm going to leave it there. And, um, well, I guess I will talk a little bit about some of the hieroglyphics, the ball court, but now we're going to move quickly um, northward uh, up to what is presently the United States. And sorry, United States, you don't get to play with us very much in the rest of the course. You had your big moment in Chicago, uh, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles. You had a lot of attention uh, at the beginning, uh, closer to the present. But this is, this is pretty much it. Um, we may stop in one more time. Um, so... 
And even this uh, Chaco Canyon, who's been to Chaco Canyon? Um, very cool site. Uh, I, I have a very deep fondness for this landscape and territory, having had some wonderful experiences there myself on multiple occasions. But I have to be honest, there's just not a lot uh, that justifies making this uh, the center of attention for the course, especially when you're in competition with the Aztecs and the Incas. Um, so sorry, um, Southwestern Puebloan cultures. Uh, this is going to be kind of quick. Uh, it's a dramatic landscape um, of arroyos. It's a canyon that, uh, to a large extent, an important feature here is that they were highly dependent on surface water sources. Uh, and thus, its vulnerability and ultimately its abandonment um, shortly after um, not, not that long after it was uh, first occupied. Um, here's a scene of the rock face of the wall that was hanging there precariously for centuries, uh, recently fell and um, crushed a bit of, the, uh, of what's left of, of the Pueblo Bonito. Pueblo Bonito uh, is the largest structure of this complex and one of the largest structures uh, di yet discovered. Uh, in the um, southwestern United States. It's um, four stories high. It, um, the scholarship uh, varies dramatically from saying it supported a population, this site supported a population of uh, up to 3,000 people, uh, which isn't a lot uh, given what the other sites we're looking at. Some people have recently said, well, not really, given the organization of the rooms, and the number of fireplaces and the capac carrying capacity of the landscape for growing uh, food it might have been as few as 70. Others have said that um, it wasn't permanently occupied, but it was a ceremonial center to which uh, peoples would come, or uh, the population would swell for a time, uh, and then they would go back. So there's a lot of speculation about this, but what is interesting is that they had a very sophisticated uh, veneer and uh, fill wall structure system, uh, very nicely dressed stone faces uh, of certain variety of that, and then timber structures, um, which distinguished this uh, construction system from many of the others locally, of which we have examples of the, the cliff dwellings, which we'll look at, and the kivas, which were half half um, submer um, underground, uh, so dropped into the earth. So here you see a sense of the, the ponderosa pine uh, beams that would have supported uh, floors above. Uh, again, it was a four-story uh, structure. Um, you can see some of the unevenness of the, the masonry, but um, quite interesting. And this uh, is, is different. Uh, in part from its siting perspective of the cliff dwellings, which in a way are uh, a very interesting symbiotic relationship to the landscape. Uh, these cliffs would form in bends in the river. Uh, the, uh, over the centuries, the erosion of this soft stone from the course of the river through this winding pattern would cut into the cliff, and as the water would, would fall, it would leave these deep, uh, caves in the cliff face, which uh, were opportunistically occupied by the Puebloan people um, in hundreds of sites, uh, some of which you can just wander along these dirt roads, park, and walk in wherever you see a trail. And in an hour or so, uh, turns out, at least in my small sample size, you're bound to run into something. And it's quite spectacular. Um, and it's kind of magical when you don't know if you're going to find something or not, and you actually do. But there's, there's hundreds, literally hundreds of these scattered around the Four Corners area of uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. Um, but here you see the action of the river. You can almost see how the water would carve into uh, the cliff face, in some cases, it carves through the hill and the, leaves these arches, and thus 
the Arches Nat National Park in Utah is filled with these natural arches, um, which we could say an awful lot about how compressive forces are transmitted through an arch, um, both man-made and in nature. Um, um, so I'll leave that to your own imagination or understanding. Um, and so uh, they would grow uh, corn, which was uh, the most productive food stuff uh, per acre uh, ever discovered uh, and or developed. It wasn't discovered, it was carefully developed, and that will be the topic of a future lecture. And um, they would store them in these granaries in the cliff um, for, for the dry uh, months. But quite uh, stunning and remarkable. And they would leave uh, artwork on the walls uh, of the cliffs. Um, they were able to uh, survive this climate despite very low rainfalls. But these, they, these uh, locations would also be the sites, as was Chaco Canyon, of a microclimate that would capture whatever clouds might be coming through. And there would be increased precipitation very locally depending on the form of the land. For the longest time, uh, we would draw pictures of ladders coming out of the roof, but there's recently been uh, some revision of our understanding of how uh, these structures were used and occupied, that that was more of a slow call, and people would come and go through an antechamber um, out one side. Um, and we've... Uh, uh, gotten more sophisticated in recognizing the rich diversity of peoples. Uh, and the, even the term Anasazi has uh, come under sharp critique uh, recently. Um, but the, uh, the interesting ecological niche occupied uh, by these uh, peoples of the US Southwest uh, is demonstrated here these very high, dry plateau area. And it really was uh, because of the, um, the water situation, which we've seen before, um, and we'll see again increasingly, that um, they both, there was a very distinct uh, several decades of uncharacteristically wet uh, weather, and then followed uh, some time later by several decades of of uncharacteristically dry weather. And so the, this local culture flourished for a time uh, and sustained itself, but only to uh, collapse as they uh, removed the tree cover um, for their structures. And they had to go increasingly far to get the kind of ponderosa pine uh, logs that they needed uh, to build with. Uh, and the loss of tree cover also uh, contributed to the dropping of the water table uh, of this shallow aquifer surface uh, water um, dependence uh, in the landscape and led ultimately to its abandonment. Um, so any questions about Chaco Canyon? As you see, I don't have the same relationship between the architecture and the narrative. Um, uh, we're still looking. So it might be that on the quiz uh, that uh, next week that we focus more on the second two sites. So any questions about, about this? Okay. Oh, this is an interesting slide where the um, the United States built its roads, uh, and now, because of this aerial viewpoint, we see the pattern of uh, the prior Puebloan uh, network of uh, connection and paths. So, so we're zooming back out south uh, to Mexico. And the next two sites we've been to before, uh, when the Spanish arrived, uh, they had two major empires that they needed to overcome against all odds. Uh, and we're starting here with the Aztec Empire, 
Um, here, we're back in Mexico City, a familiar site with the, uh, the National Palace of Mexico, which was built on the ruins of uh, Montezuma's palace, the Aztec ruler. And here we see the ruins remains recently uh, uncovered in the last few decades of the Templo Mayor, the Grand Temple at the center of the Aztec uh, political religious world. Uh, and uh, constantly discovering new things as new buildings. The subway tunnel uh, for the new subway system in Mexico City has been um, very revealing in terms of new evidence. Uh, we're going to be looking primarily at the Templo Mayor, but also at the Eagle Warriors house uh, right here. Um, and imagine this facing this way to the open plaza and the Temple of the Sun uh, lies beneath the Metropolitan Cathedral, which was one of the things we looked at uh, during the Spanish uh, chapter of this. So here we have the main Templo Mayor, uh, which was an altar for sacrificial offerings uh, to the great uh, Aztec god. Um, I'm going to mispronounce this. Not Quetzalcoatl. I can say Quetzalcoatl. Hautzalopochtli. How's that? Um, so we're going to go through this uh, in a more uh, familiar way that um, the key moment in this history is really when Tlaka El uh, becomes a, a crucial figure in the hierarchy of the Aztec. Now, the Aztec uh, is almost not the right word because uh, it's, uh, the Aztec was constituted by three cultures that were allied together. The most powerful of the three cultures in the Aztec Triple Alliance was the Mexica, which is spelled like Mexica, uh, which gives us Mexico. And so the Mexica, when I say Mexica, picture that word looking like Mexico and being associated with the modern nation state that is named after the dominant culture of the Aztec Triple Alliance. Tlaca El El was the key mover and shaker at a crucial moment in 1428 uh, in the Mexica hierarchy. And... Um, one of the first things that happens here is uh, that uh, it is built right on top of the location where um, Hatzalopochtli came to uh, the ruler in a dream in 1325 and uh, showed uh, a cactus with a eagle uh, devouring a snake. And surrounding that eagle and the snake were the, were the skeletal remains of all the other animals uh, that the eagle had devoured. And the message, the voice in the dream said, uh, this is where you will found your empire. And so uh, a few days later, they're wandering around. They're being displaced from one place to another. They're kind of the warrior losers of the local power struggles between multiple different tribes. And they get displaced away from the rich farmlands of the shores of um, uh, the lake. Uh, and they end up on the swampy patch in the middle of the lake. And that's when they see the cactus, the Tenochtli, uh, Tenochtli Cactus, uh, that's the name of the cactus, with the eagle on it eating the snake. And so that's where they build the temple. Um, but the temple is, is uh, built in seven stages. Uh, and so this temple is there to remind everyone that this was the origins of the Mexica um, you know, period. Uh, they rebuilt the island. They rebuilt the swampy area of land in the middle of the lake, and it became the island of Tenochtitlan, which is named after the cactus. 
And so that's where Tenochtitlan comes from. That was the name of the city. Um, and the altar on top, you can see here in National Geographic's brilliant uh, illustration, illustrative imagination, uh, the human sacrifice that was required uh, for the constant renewal of uh, the powers of the gods to bring about daytime every day. So it was a constant struggle of the gods to gain the strength to allow day to occur. So every day, you need to strengthen the gods, and you need to have, uh, uh, you need to feed the gods through human sacrifice. And so this temple complex is, uh, in a large way, uh, the center of this activity, this ritual sacrifice of humans, um, uh, this demand for constantly enlarging uh, and to renew um, this commitment. This is an early depiction of it, and you see um, the two temples, uh, one uh, to the god of war and one to the god of rain. So this was the agricultural side, and this was um, the place of human sacrifice and a rack at the top to house the skulls that would be covered in plaster and put on display uh, um, at the top of the, of the temple. Again, you see the feathered serpent motif uh, coming in, um, here recently uncovered. Uh, here's a European depiction of the barbarism of the human sacrifice and the rack of skulls of the Zompantli uh, uh, rack of skulls. Uh, and the, the, um, this sacrifice uh, was in part of the reenactment of both the, um, the story of the eagle, the remains of all the animals surrounding the eagle in the dream, uh, is, is, a, is a reference to this, or this is a reference to that vision of the dream. It's also a reference to the origin mythology of Hautzilopochli. I should have rehearsed that. Uh, but I thought I did, but no matter, it's, that's a hard one. So um, Hautzilopochli's origin story is that when he was born, he was the, the, the warrior god, he came out of his mother fully grown and in full armor with his sword drawn. Uh, ouch. Uh, but he needed to do that because uh, his sister and her brothers were there to kill him and his mother. As soon as he was born, they, they were going to kill him. But he surprises them by emerging fully grown and ready for battle. He quickly lops the head off of his sister. The head rolls down. Uh, and that is where the, uh, the ball court, uh, where the ball is a representation of the skull of the enemy. Uh, so the two temples of the ball court, uh, again, we saw this in the Mayan site, uh, but also the Rack of Skulls. This is a direct reference to the origin story of Hautzilopochli. Um, the temple itself is built in multiple levels. Uh, and so the sacrifice uh, of not just humans, but also animals and valuable things, uh, and they, they've dug this up. And this is what they find when they make a subway in Mexico. Go figure. And then they put them in a museum. But I don't know. That looks a lot more interesting than this. So this is uh, maybe they found it walking in the woods someday. Um, so here's uh, a model. They're trying to picture the multiple phases of developing this pyramid, uh, the Templo Mayor. They built one in 1325, almost immediately after seeing uh, the eagle on the cactus. The first thing they do is they build a little one out of wood and earth. And then every few decades, they expand it and they, they build it higher uh, to do a better job feeding the needs of, of the, um, the gods and, and give them strength. And it's built. Uh, and this is the level where humans occupy the earth, and then it represents the 13 distinct layers of the heavens. And below it, there are nine levels of the underworld. And um, 
this is uh, a very direct reminder of those multiple levels of the universe. Um, the commitment, uh, here we see the excavation where you see uh, the multiple staircases of the different configurations and they've uh, lit it up for us at night. So we see the multiple uh, phases of development. And each time uh, a new layer is added, we see um, the ritual sacrifice, one of the more dramatic ones uh, over the course of four days. Uh, they, they slaughtered uh, 4,000 uh, humans in 1487. Uh, when they did the sixth of the seven uh, editions. Um, here we see uh, the temple devoted to the serpent spirit that uh, uh, is illuminated on the equinox. So again, you have this archaeo-astronomical uh, condition of orientation to the cardinal points and uh, very carefully reflecting the movement of the sun and the earth. And, um, and then you see the ball court beyond that. So on this axis, you see the Templo Mayor, um, devoted to the god of rain, the god of war. Uh, then you see uh, the temple of Quetzalcoatl, uh, the serpent, uh, the feathered serpent deity, which is also depicted on the stairs. And then finally, you see the ball court, where we toss around the skull of the defeated sister. Uh, and then you have the temple of the sun. Now, here's a key moment of truth in all of this. It turns out that um, Tlaka LL, at the moment of victory over the, Ch um, uh, the these, there were four kings that were threatening the Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance was formed to combat these four kings. And when the Triple Alliance, the Aztec Triple Alliance, led by the Mexica, uh, were victorious, the custom was to uh, destroy the Codex, the record of the history of those who were defeated. Um, but Tlaka LL took it one step further. He said, our own Codex, our own history, uh, represents us as a weak people. We were wandering in the wilderness, uh, displaced from this place and that place until we stumbled upon this swamp. Uh, we built it up uh, from scratch into this great city uh, centered on this temple complex. Um, but it's not the greatest history. Let's destroy our codex as well. And so that's what he did. And in place, he wrote a new history. The new history displaces the sun god from the center of attention, displaces Quetzalcoatl from the center of attention, and in its place, Hautzalopochtli becomes the supreme god, and Hautzalopochtli requires human sacrifice. And so this was a carefully conceived uh, historical uh, narrative that sets up this system of constant human sacrifice, constant expansion of the temple, and constant expansion of the empire. And so it's, uh, this is the, the key point um, that we're able to talk about because of this history. And we see the central temple complex uh, of Tenochtitlan, the Mexica capital, and then the precincts around it. And uh, the Juego de Polot, Poloto, Polota is the ball court. Uh, the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, and the Eagle House. We're going to be looking at the Eagle House, which is a tribute to the warriors who are responsible for uh, the ever-expanding empire. Um, and so there's the, the temple, and we're going to be looking at, in relationship to the uh, Temple of the Sun God. Uh, about here is where the Temple of Quetzalcoatl would be, and then the ball court um, further on. There's a visualization of that. Um, and now we're going to go in uh, and check out um, the evidence. And there, there you see the, I think this is a Tenochtitli cactus. Who knows? OK. Um, but they've recently excavated the uh, Eagle Warrior House here. It's an L-shaped uh, structure 
with an entry hall that is guarded by two eagle warriors in full uh, eagle headdress, uh, quite spectacular. And it's these benches. This is the location where the warriors of uh, the empire would sit in uh, group meditation and performing rituals of self-sacrifice. They would actually take uh, these needles and pierce different parts of their body uh, as a demonstration of their willingness for self-sacrifice, uh, sitting on these benches on top of depictions of the former great warriors. Um, and then they would stick the blood-soaked needle into a ball of grass, and, and that would soak up the blood of these warriors. And this was a, a kind of a ritual enactment, reenactment, of the sacrifice required of warfare. Uh, if we had more time, we could, or I could, and then present it to you, figure out uh, the multiple different versions of this model that you've been seeing going by. Each one depicts it slightly differently. The ball court changes. The um, uh, So it's kind of a demonstration of how we're still trying to figure this out. Uh, here is an artist's rendition of what uh, Tenochtitlan looked like prior to the Spanish arrival. And at that moment in time, it was the, arguably the largest city in history, in the world. Uh, and it was uh, much higher and much grander and much more densely populated. The marketplace had anywhere between 20,000 and 60,000 vendors. Uh, on feast days, it would swell to the upper number. Um, this is a comparison of uh, how um, they would fill the land and build these uh, pyramid structures. Um, there, and here we get to the issue of water. This island in the middle of Lake Texacoco was, uh, it was a brackish lake. And so to be supplied with drinking water, they actually would have to tap into springs uh, fairly distant and then bring that water in aqueducts across the lake and into the city. And it was a remarkable achievement um, uh, of engineering. Uh, and here we see the, the frogs that were an allusion to that. And then you see the water channels actually set in the plaza that are there to supply water um, to the temples. And this is a map um, drawn by Cortez's uh, people. Uh, speaking of the, the remarkable wonders of Tenochtitlan. Now, granted, he was probably trying to impress uh, uh, the monarch uh, and to encourage further investment in the glorious colonial escapades uh, in search of silver, gold, and souls. Uh, but it, is, uh, it, it really was this remarkable achievement of these wide causeways uh, wide boulevards leading to this remarkable temple complex, a hundred foot high pyramid, uh, and these gar these floating, so-called floating gardens that weren't really floating. Uh, they were actually um, burned up uh, in the water, dredging up and building these long, narrow strips of land uh, with canals between them for the purposes of moving canoes in and out through the agricultural garden plots. They would plant willow and cypress trees at the corners. Uh, to hold them, um, and you start to see some of those depictions uh, in this um, panel of, I don't think that's Diego Rivera, but it's, um, but just imagining this incredible uh, shimmering temple sacred complex at the center of Tenochtitlan. It, it was beyond anything that any of the conquistadors had ever experienced. Here's um, one artist's rendition of these uh, these floating gardens um, that surrounded the city. Uh, and here, we've seen this before, um, the new subway tunnel that goes around the excavation of the Templo Mayor, the uh, Eagle Warrior House up at the top. And um, every place they dig the tunnel, they uncover uh, they just discover new things. And here's the uh, temple to the sun god uh, underneath the Metropolitan Cathedral. And here's another version of that. We've seen this. And here is Diego Rivera's uh, rendition of the former Aztec uh, capital 
religious center being displaced by uh, the national palace. Uh, and so the, the, um, the larger system here is the role played um, by, by history, by the telling of history, specific type of history uh, that uh, performs a task in terms of mobilizing uh, and focusing the energies of an entire empire uh, towards ever expanding uh, both the monuments and of the, uh, the territory. The, um, on the more positive side, uh, there was a cultural flourishing at this time of the Mexica culture. They had more great, uh, great literary works than the Greeks, uh, and they were all written down and recorded, uh, and they spoke this remarkably poetic language where you never directly stated, there wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship between words and meaning. Every important meaning that they were expressing required them to say two things. These two things were often in contradiction or in juxtaposition uh, not totally settled, that it always required the listener to puzzle out what was being said, uh, what the author was getting at. And so it was this kind of political opera or poetic operation that would require some effort on the part of the listener in order to also discover the truth behind the words. And so a little bit like what we're hoping this course will do. And the tone in my phone tells me we should move on. I think I'm on time for the first time ever. Let's hope I can keep it up. Questions? Okay, going down south. Uh, back down to Cusco. We've been there before. We saw the, the Spanish uh, church convent, Santo Domingo, built on top of uh, this key uh, structure, and now uh, we're back to Cusco to look at what lies underneath that cathedral. Um, and here we've seen this wall, uh, we've seen this masonry, uh, and this is the uh, digital uh, visualization of the gold work uh, of um, Pachacuti's Corticancha Temple of the Sun. So uh, a similar thing happened with Pachacuti. Uh, in 1438, uh, the, um, his father's army, his father and his, his brothers um, were the victims of a, of, a, of a surprise attack by the Chaka. And the father fled away. His brothers fled away. Only Pachacuti stood his ground and fought. And he fought so ferociously that the history, uh, be that as it may, the history tells the story of the very rocks themselves rose up and fought against the Chaka invaders. And Pachacuti, uh, with or without the help of the stones of the Cusco Valley, um, were triumphant. And when he presented the corpses of the defeated Chaka to his father so that he could ceremonially wipe his feet on the dead bodies of the enemy, the father said, I decline. I offer it to your oldest brother. And Pachacuti's response was, I'm not going to let these girls wipe their feet on, you know, so he's making fun of uh, the cowardice of his brothers trying to honor his father. And uh, the father is so upset by this, he decides he's, he has no choice. He has to kill his youngest son, who's getting a little too big for his britches. Uh, his son is forewarned. Um, the father and the brothers flee. And Pachacuti takes the name Pachacuti, which means world shaker. And shake the world he does. Uh, he starts by rebuilding uh, Cusco. Um, and he also uh, chooses the god that he thinks uh, should be part of this story. And he uh, elevates the sun god uh, through the Coracancha sun house, which is the temple that now lies beneath the church and convent of Santo Domingo in Cusco uh, in, in current uh, the nation of Peru. 
Um, and the gold, the technique of the gold, uh, I can talk about this because there it is. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. Um, this is not gold leaf. This is not the thin veneer, the, the microscopic thin layer of gold. This is gold plating. This is solid. Well, it's not quite solid gold. They had this technique where they would uh, forge copper and gold together. And uh, the results would look coppery because the copper oxidation of the copper would dominate. And then what they would do is they would shape it and heat it and to accelerate the oxidation of the copper, which you recognize as green. And then they would hammer the, the resulting plates. And so they were these thick, structurally rigid plates. They would hammer it, and that would chip off the oxidation. And they would do that multiple times and then polish it up and so that the outer coating of these, uh, these rigid metal objects would be shiny gold and the copper would be the substrata that supports this rigid. So it was like being able to have these uh, quite sturdy elements that uh, appear as gold. And so some would say this entire wall was faced with plating uh, that was gold. Um, this is a more restrained visualization of that. So uh, thank you National Geographic for giving us something to look at that would allow me to tell the story of this house of the sun, this dedication to the sun god, is where the seven mummified kings of uh, the great Inca, the Incas of the past, the name of the ruler is Inca. So these seven mummified Inca rulers um, were considered to be continuously ruling. So they're not done. No one inherits their wealth. They keep their wealth, and it's maintained and their bodies are maintained, their palaces are maintained. And um, uh, Pachacuti's innovation is that he brings them all together in the house uh, devoted to the sun god, Coricancha, and seats them on a golden bench, not shown. Uh, and uh, they continue the, uh, the rituals of deification of these dead mummified kings who continue to rule um, as if they were still alive. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the Inca were so susceptible to uh, the Spanish is because uh, the, the devotion of the followers of these kings uh, were still following these kings. That leads to uh, fractionalism uh, and division. Cusco was a city uh, for housing royalty, uh, the administrators, the highest ranking administrators, administrators of this ever expanding, again, this expanding empire. Um, here are the locations of the different kings and the different uh, moments of rule um, and that, um, that are represented. We're still uncovering uh, some of these sites. But in Coricancha, um, they've excavated uh, the sun house walls, and we see the characteristic masonry. There are two styles of masonry. This is the uh, ashlar uh, coarse masonry, a very uh, consistent uh, rows and columns type pattern of uh, masonry that you expect, um, of interlocking masonry with large lintels and these trapezoidal forms for windows and doors. Um, and it's uh, just beautifully articulated. Uh, enough cannot be said if you um, read anything. that They really just always talk about the miraculous quality of the masonry uh, that was developed prior to the rise of the Inca, um, but adopted and used very effectively. The structure of Cusco is around these blocks. Uh, in this case, this city block consists of two concha courtyard households. Uh, at, with the central house, uh, but so far they believe that there was no circulatory connection between this concha and that concha, um, which uh, it, it um, contradicts the reading that we would find in this. In this, but you see the stone masonry, the wooden—they're uh, not rafters; they're girders, and uh, the thatch roof. And here we see um, holes in the floor 
that were part of the weaving process. And so they would string sticks and, and um, threads uh, through these holes in the, in the ground stones. And they would use these held up with a cross piece uh, to do weaving. Here we see some of the, uh, the other masonry, the, the polygonal masonry, of a much more complex order um, constituting these walls. Um, so the Sacred Valley of Cusco uh, is, is the center of the empire of a constantly expanding empire. You see here Cajamarca, which is the location where Pizarro ambushed uh, Atahualpa at the moment of the Spanish conquest. Um, and so here we see the Cancha blocks uh, grouped together uh, in the center of Cusco. And we see these four roads that cross at the center of Cusco. So these four roads uh, that lead to Chichai Suyu, Kunti Suyu, Anti Suyu, and Kola Suyu. And this, these are the four quarters of the empire. So the, this vast empire comes together at the intersection, at the center of town. Um, there are also these two plazas uh, to the north and south of the crossing. Um, and it's the, the uh, fortress temple on top of the hill uh, overlooks it. Here's the largest of the uh, Inca structures and how structurally it, it is put together. Um, Columns and posts are typically avoided, but when you get to very long spans, they become necessary. And so one of the signals of a very important building is that it has these uh, intermediary columns and or post holes um, to catch the uh, structural loads of an exceptionally large roof. And here we see uh, a, a very clear example of this important Inca uh, temple site with a niche within the niche and, a, and then a window in that. This is one of the common things where there would be sentry guards in each of these. Um, and the niche uh, uh, beyond it. And then we see the introduction uh, of an arch. This is uh, from the Spaniards. Uh, the Inca did not have arches. They did not have wheels except in children's toys. Interestingly enough, um, uh, and then you see the Spanish construction on top of the Inca once again. And so you see the, the four streets that go out to the empire. You see the, uh, the remains of the Inca structures. Um, and then you see Sacsayhuaman uh, overlooking, that's the fortress temple. And down here you see the Coracancha. And there's that curved wall that we saw covered with gold. And that's the organization. And it was conceived of as a panther, or sometimes it's called a puma, uh, that the town is uh, taking on this zoomorphic form uh, of the panther. And uh, we're going to look, um, we've looked a little bit at the Coracancha. We're, now we're going to look up at the uh, fortress temple of Sacsayhuaman. Um, and here we see Cusco um, uh, in the last century uh, and this elevated uh, site, um, the zigzag walls of the head of the puma. And at the center, there is a round tower that's believed to have performed, uh, there was an important element of water um, management uh, on this site. And uh, the growth of um, the town. Uh, the, so several towers would have been here um, to help uh, protect and overlook uh, the capital. And on Rotadero Hill, there is the throne of the Inca. So this also had an important, not just a religious, but also a military function. And uh, here we are looking across to Sacsayhuaman and the Moyok Marca round tower uh, with water channels. And here's the throne of the Inca. Uh, just remarkably precise cutting of the live rock 
uh, embedded in the hill itself. And here's the famous 12-sided um, polygonal stone. Um, it gets even more complex because of the, uh, the shape that you're not seeing. But where these stones meet, it is not a flat plane. This is not something that slides in and out. They would be very carefully sequenced. There was an MIT scholar who's been speculating on this and had an exhibition apparently in the last year or so. Um, uh, not quite getting it right um, yet. He was going to be coming with us to Machu Picchu in a few weeks, but um, I guess he's not coming, which is too bad. And so here are the two, um, the two styles of masonry. This is tough enough, but as tough as this is, this is uh, defies all logic. Now the interesting thing about this is that this entire economy that mobilized all this work uh, was not, did not use money. It uh, was the obligation of conscript labor. The rulers of the Inca Empire occupied the houses of Cusco. The provincial leaders would come in four months out of the year and occupy this ring of suburbs, and they would maintain these embassies uh, in the outer ring of Cusco, and then they'd meet in the center of the city. Uh, there was this interesting incremental uh, subjugation that would start with public works, and often the public works were the great streets and the roads, the interconnection of the system, uh, the dramatically sophisticated water systems that would be in the center of the streets of Cusco, these culverts. Um, and so there was the, uh, the organization of the entire empire here in Cusco, uh, and there was a secondary uh, system. Well, here we see the larger territorial manifestation of those four roads. Those four roads would, would spread out from Cusco and connect to these four realms. Uh, and so Cusco at the center, connected by the roads, was almost this cosmological diagram. In addition to that system of four lines, there was a, not, a secondary system of some 40-something 40, 40 lines. I think it's 43 lines. That These are the spirit lines. These spirit lines connect the landscape around Cusco, the valley, uh, to these, these uh, hundreds of stones and temples and religious sites, uh, of which this is one. Uh, the stones that rose up and uh, fought against the Chaka alongside um, uh, Pacha, um, Pachacuti's uh, battles. And uh, so there is this very strong connectedness between the landscape uh, and its spiritual role in the belief system that Pachacuti sets up. The road system uh, is a remarkable accomplishment. 25,000 miles of these stone roads uh, winding through some of the most difficult topography in the world. Uh, a system like the Caravanserai that we saw in Samarkand. We have a system of Tambo uh, inns along the way. The remarkable use of suspension bridges. The, um, the Spaniards were terrified of these suspension bridges because you can't, you can't, you can't hang things. Europeans did not hang things. They didn't sleep in hammocks. They slept in beds. Compression, not, not tension. They uh, just, uh, some scholars have stretched it to, they used bolos and slings, always fabrics. Uh, fabrics were the strategic thing. They didn't use metals for warfare. Uh, they used metals for decorating the temples. And uh, they used, for warfare, they used tension. They used fabrics. Their armor was fabric. They had moccasins. So there's this interesting world of the world of compression of Europe and the world of tension um, of the Americas, or at least of the Incas. Um, a fascinating, thought-provoking uh, speculation. These roads uh, connected the salt works that are still operating to the present moment. They had a very sophisticated method of writing uh, through knots. And there's this kind of binary knotted chord uh, method of record keeping. I don't really understand it. If you want to understand it, uh, building, there's like a third floor. Where is that? It's between, the, you have to go into building 16. Building 16. It's still up there. It is. 
I have it on my iPhone. Um, so the, the remarkable success, uh, despite the landscape, is that you have what's called, uh, historians have labeled this, uh, ge geographers have labeled this, a vertical archipelago, oh, there it is, of geographic diversity. Of the 34 recognized distinct biological, ecological niches on the planet, 20 of them, uh, a remarkable concentration of them, are in this coastal Andes formation. So by connecting between the water where you get fish up to the river valleys where you get uh, vegetables, uh, squash, uh, potato, uh, up to the higher uh, elevations where you can grow quinoa and other grains, uh, and then in the highest elevations where you can uh, raise llama and alpaca, and then you connect via the road system uh, so that you have this great diversity of productive landscape uh, and a system of trade that connects them all. We're out of time, but it's um, while you're thinking of your questions, we're just going to quickly look at Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is this weird example of a, a town for the elite that is built very late in the story, 1450 uh, or thereabouts. And it's way up high in the saddle between, uh, between two very sharp mountains. Uh, it's a few days walk, several days walk from Cusco. And it has this very sophisticated water system, which is probably the only thing we have time to look at. Um, but it's, it supported a very, um, po a very large population, as you can see, with these stone terraced uh, uh, gardens, uh, despite the, the steepness of the slopes. And um, they had to bring water to this site uh, from the other peaks. And they did it with this aqueduct that controls the velocity of the water, as we see, uh, we're going to see with the Romans, that if the water goes too fast, uh, it's a problem. If the water goes too slow, it's also a problem. And despite the uh, dramatic complexity of the topography, they were able to uh, control the path of the water. And here we see it um, here uh, overlaying the Temple of the Sun in, in Machu Picchu. Uh, you see the channel. They, they had a series of internalized uh, channels inside the rock walls. So uh, because of their uh, sophistication with the cutting of stone and fitting of stone, they were able to create what would constitute basically pipes, internal plumbing, uh, in the stone walls. And here you see some of it exposed. Here's a case where it actually crosses over a chasm. Um, remarkable. Uh, engineering feet. And the system would be used to irrigate the crops. Um, uh, here's an engineering analysis of the pitch of the aqueducts and uh, along its complex course through Machu Picchu. And into the gardens here you see kind of the covered channels uh, through the city. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. They did not use metal. They actually used a sharp rock. And uh, they used other stones. They didn't use uh, metal implements for that. Um, I probably should say one more thing about uh, the connection to developmentalism. You see on the sheet, I'm making an assertion. Because they didn't have money, they would actually, uh, they wouldn't conquer, they expanded their empire through this version of developmentalism that you'll remember from the 20th century, that they would arrive in a new location, they would say, hi, we're, we're these Incas, um, here's, here's a gift. And they would give, they would lavish these wealthy, these riches on the local leaders and, and ask in return for someone to live in the village. And so that would happen, and then 10 years later, someone would show up again, and little bit by little bit, they, 
uh, involve the leadership in this larger economy of trade. And before you know it, they're sending all their men to work on the road system. And the, to keep the empire busy, they produced remarkable surpluses of everything. They had warehouses filled with surplus food, surplus fabrics. And they would use these, uh, they would give gift these things to the local villages. And this is a remarkable example of incremental developmentalist aid programs that expand, uh, take over the leadership, and then the largesse of the state through this kind of socialist system that doesn't use uh, money, that kind of takes over. And so it's a very interesting example of, uh, of a strategy that is not so alien. Like that we've never seen quite this combination of developmentalism and socialism. Okay, now any questions? That was just that point I wanted to sneak in there. Okay, thank you everyone.